If I were to ask you what system is more powerful, a games console or a gaming PC, then chances are a lot of you would go for the PC. However, this wasn't always the case, especially in the late 80s and early 90s, a strange and confusing time for gaming, or at least strange and confusing to someone born in 1996. But with computers being expensive, and lacking proper dedicated gaming hardware, it wasn't that uncommon that many games that got ported to the PC actually ended up being significantly worse than its console counterpart. And that is what we are going to be taking a look at today, because apparently I hate myself and thought it would be fun to look at these games. Welcome to Port Patrol, the show where I look at weird, interesting, or knockoff ports of video games, and today we're taking a look at disastrous DOS ports of NES classics. First off, we are going to be taking a look at Castlevania, which I am very happy about because it means I get to use absolutely nothing but Castlevania music for the next five minutes or so, which is always a big plus in my books. Released in 1990, two years after the original Western release, and four after the Japanese, it was developed by Distinctive Software Incorporated, which I'm assuming had more than three employees, but only three of them wanted to work on this, apparently. The first thing you have no doubt already noticed is that this game is jank central when it comes to performance. It runs nowhere near as smooth as the original, and while it may not look too bad on its own, it does make playing it a much more strenuous ordeal than it needs to be. Because of this, the game sometimes has trouble tracking your inputs, which is definitely the reason I died so much. It's not because I suck, honest. Though getting past the literal 9 FPS this game runs at, and yes it is literally 9, I counted, I'd say the graphics still hold up pretty well. Obviously it doesn't hold a candle to the original, and Simon you know, he looks a bit weird. But for the most part, they nailed the look of Castlevania, with sprites mostly resembling their NES cousins, albeit looking a little bit chunkier. And once again, ignoring the whole, this game literally runs at 9 FPS, Thing, the gameplay holds up pretty well too. I know you probably think I'm insane saying that, because uh, you're, you're looking at the game and it looks awful, but I, I promise it doesn't play quite as bad as it looks. All of the levels made it across just as they were in the original, complete with all enemies, sub-weapons and secrets, and hey, that's more than you can say for most of the stuff I cover on this channel. But again, there is the big massive, glaring elephant in the room, which is just impossible to get over. For as good a job the artists did for capturing the look of Castlevania, and the programmer did at capturing the feel of Castlevania, the frame rate is like a roundhouse kick straight in the nuts that ruins any chance this game has of being fun. And it's sadly not something you can fix, this is the intended frame rate, held back by the hardware it was made to be ran on. IBM PCs at the time did not have the dedicated hardware to redraw the screen fast enough to create silky smooth side-scrolling. It's why it runs at 9fps here, but 60 on console. It wasn't thought possible to get such smooth gameplay on PC until John Carmack from id used a technique called Adaptive Tile Refresh, which basically meant instead of redrawing the entire screen at once, just redraw what actually changes. If the background of the screen is black and stays black, why waste resources redrawing it over and over again? id would go on to use this technique in their debut game, Commander Keen, and as you can see, the results speak for themselves. In that sense then, as easy as it is to rag on the game for having a piss poor frame rate, I honestly feel like I don't want to be too harsh. Sure, it doesn't play that well, but that's not entirely their fault. The people working on this game did a good job of creating a faithful port of Castlevania. 
It's just a shame that the circumstances of PC hardware at the time make it borderline unplayable. One thing I do feel like I can criticise though, is the music. I don't know if I'm just like, an utter retard when it comes to DOS. Okay I do, I, I do know I'm pretty done with it. But unlike games I'm more familiar with, like Duke Nukem 3D, Doom, or even some later games in this very same video, I couldn't find any way to change sound card settings, which meant it played all sound through PC speaker mode. A PC speaker is a speaker located in a PC. You probably guessed that part. Its main use is to warn you when stuff goes wrong, but some games at the time also made use of it. The problem with using the PC speaker, however, is that it is only capable of making one sound at a time, which is really what you want when your game features both music and sound effects. Yeah, it works just about as well as you would expect. For the next game, I'm going to be taking you back to the past. No, not to 1990 when this game came out, although I suppose I will be doing that too. We are going back to 2014, to the release of the first ever episode of Port Patrol, Mega Man for MS-DOS. For those who haven't watched it, please don't. The first two minutes are me complaining about being depressed because I was just a little bummed out at the time. <laughs> oh, 17 year old me. If only you really knew what depression felt like. And the video is in such bad quality, I don't even know how I managed to do it. Look, times were strange back then. I didn't know what OBS was. So what better time to have another look at this game? than in a video all about bad MS-DOS ports. Because oh boy, this game is bad. Developed by Rosner Labs in 1990, which was three whole years after the original game came out, just want you to bear that in mind as we look at this, three years after the original, Mega Man for MS-DOS takes everything that was good about Mega Man and takes a big, fat, steaming shit right on top of it. Apparently developed by someone who actually liked the originals, any evidence of that is completely absent here, bearing absolutely zero resemblance to the game it's meant to be a port of. Featuring only three stages with weird discount robot masters as bosses, it is thankfully a short game, but that doesn't make it any less painful to play through. And part of why that is, is because this game has some of the most baffling and just straight up awful level design ever to be conceived in a video game. You can barely get a moment's rest in this game without having shit constantly flung at you. Enemies are often too short for you to shoot at, meaning you have no choice but to try and avoid them until you get better weapons. If an enemy isn't too short, they come at you from near impossible angles for you to easily stop them, and they come constantly because the moment you go off screen, they will respawn. And most annoyingly, there are constantly tiny little pissing turrets which are nearly impossible to see, which shoot pellets at you the moment you enter on screen, leaving very, very little chance to avoid them. Even worse, there is virtually no pattern behind any enemy attacks meaning you can't even memorise patterns to get past them. On this level, a bucket constantly comes past and drops lava on you. Sometimes if you stay still, the lava misses. Sometimes if you stay still, it will hit you. And sometimes when you run backwards to avoid it, it goes fuck you and drops two bits of lava instead. 
The Robot Masters aren't the only thing here that are a bit discount either. Instead of pitting you against any of Mega Man's well-known and recognisable robotic enemies, the game instead pits you against frogs. Like, like real, actual frogs. Because, you know, I guess that's cooler than fighting a robot. Just about the only thing in this game that actually resembles Mega Man is the disappearing block parts of the levels. And of everything about Mega Man that could have made it into this game, for the love of god, why did it have to be these? Platforming feels awful in this game. The only thing consistent about this game's frame rate is how consistently awful it is. When an enemy comes on screen, it slows to a crawl, but the moment you're alone, it speeds up way too fast, resulting in an experience so frustrating it makes you want to turn it off and never play it again. Unfortunately for us, and by that I mean unfortunately for me, Rosner Labs wasn't done torturing us yet, as they actually went on to make a sequel. To YouTube user Ching Bung Bung, who brought this to my attention, I hate you. It was called Mega Man 3. I don't know why they skipped to. But hey, everyone has a chance to improve, so maybe this game will be marginally better. I'll give you a hint. No. Though I will give credit where credit is due, this game does actually look more like a Mega Man game. The original featured those b tech ass robot masters, which looked nothing like Mega Man's art style, and featured virtually no enemies from the original game. Mega Man 3, however, does manage to capture the look of a real Mega Man game, as long as you ignore the fact 90% of the time it looks identical to the first. The Robot Masters actually look the part, although that's because they're all just recolours of existing ones. Some enemies from the original also make an appearance, which makes it all the more baffling why I still have to fight really dumb enemies like walking plants. However, I can't really say the same care and attention went into how the levels look, because they all virtually use the exact same tile set. I sure hope you love getting dripped on by leaky buckets of oil, because that's about half of this game. What if I told you the level design somehow got worse? Because I'm not sure about you guys, but whenever I played Mega Man, I always wished the levels weren't the golden shining example of linear level design they are, but were instead god-awful, shitty mazes. Although at least thankfully there are less tiny enemies you can't shoot, that is instantly ruined by the fact they double down on turrets that you can barely see coming. Though credit where credit is due, I suppose, the actual layout of the levels aren't the worst thing ever. Despite being maze-like in design, I never really found myself getting lost. Plus, the branching paths allow for more hidden areas where health is hidden, which actually makes the game a lot easier than the first. Apart from on two stages, where they had the brilliant idea of making them water levels. Probably some of the worst water levels in history. The water physics are just bizarre. I know it looks like I'm playing like an absolute idiot, but I'm honestly trying my hardest. It's unlike any other game I've played. It's too slow until it's suddenly too fast. It's too fast until you suddenly grind to a halt. The water constantly tries to push you upwards, so you have to try and fight that. And let me tell you, Mega Man does not handle well, which really goes great with all the precise movements it wants you to make. While still being a shockingly awful game, I would be willing to argue it's at least a little bit better than the first one. So I guess it has that going for it. Enemies no longer constantly respawn, and actually stay dead until you run out of lives. Meaning you can clear a path for yourself in one life and make it easily through next time. It's almost like a roguelike, except not at all in any way possible. And it's quite funny that despite how much crap the game throws at you, once you get a weapon that fires multiple shots at once, the bosses become absolutely piss easy. But if there's one good thing about these games... Okay, just the first one. If there's one good thing about Mega Man 1, is that it was partially responsible for the creation of Port Patrol. 
And that's about the only good thing I can say about it. The last game we're thankfully taking a look at today is Ninja Gaiden. Or Ninja Gaiden, if you say it like that. I'm gonna be saying it both ways, just to annoy everyone. Now you're probably thinking that although there was a Ninja Gaiden on NES, it was actually released in arcades first, so it doesn't really count as an NES classic for this video. Well, if you could go back in time and tell me of that fact before I finished writing the script, I would really appreciate it. For now though, I suppose we can look at it as a case study of how different companies tackle different ports for different systems. Perhaps realising they wouldn't be able to make an arcade perfect version of Ninja Gaiden for NES, Tecmo instead made it such a different experience that it would stand up on its own. Or maybe they just thought the arcade version they made was a bit lame. If it's anything like the DOS version, I wouldn't blame them. Ninja Gaiden is about as tedious as pulling teeth and as fun as a brain tumour. That is honestly the nicest way I can put it. Whereas the NES version is a fast-paced, action-packed, fun 2D platformer, the DOS version is a slow, sloppy, sluggish excuse of a beat-em-up, and yes, it really is meant to run that slowly. I mean, what the hell? I thought I was meant to be playing as a ninja, not a paraplegic. Oh, not proud of that one. If you look at this and try to imagine what it plays like, I guarantee it is worse than however you are imagining it. The controls are definitely the biggest offender, though that's like trying to pick out the worst child molester out of a group of other child molesters. You know, everything here is awful. But the controls are weird and sticky. If you need to turn around, you need to hold down the button for quite a while until you actually do. And you don't even get the vaguely cathartic pleasure of button bashing your way through the game, as the one and only attack you have in this game is done by holding down the attack button. Yeah, that looks about right. Technically, you can also do a flying kick after jumping, but it's so fickle as to when it'll actually work that it's barely worth trying to pull off. And so, this is Ninja Gaiden. You walk forward a little bit, hold down the attack button until an enemy walks into you, walk forward a little bit more, rinse and repeat until you beat the game. I wish I could say it was more involved than that, but it really isn't. About the most complex thing you have to do in this game is ensure that you're on the exact same level as the enemy so you can actually hit them. It's very specific and oftentimes very annoying. As you might have gathered by now, I don't like this game very much. I'm a big fan of the original Ninja Gaidens, and this game ruins everything about them. Everything that could be awful in this game, pretty much is. Apart from the difficulty, which is actually incredibly easy. Usually, I would class this as a negative, but being so easy meant that I only had to play for it once so it actually ended up being quite a good thing here. Ninja Gaiden. Hey, at least you only have to play it once. Another blessing in disguise is the fact there are only three levels. Again, usually a negative, but I will gladly take it here. All three levels are virtually identical. They're just straight lines, with another level above that you can also jump to. Sometimes there will be an obstacle in the way, such as a phone box that you can kick enemies into, which is actually way too cool to be in this game, what the hell? And there's a boss at the end of each level, who you defeat in the exact same way as everyone else. Honestly, there isn't much to say about this game. Surprising how I can have so little to say about a game where all you need to do is walk forward and hold down a button. All in all, it was probably the worst 23 minutes of my life, and the icing on the cake was definitely the ending screen that just hard cuts back to DOS. Absolutely beautiful.